Uh, there are two parts in this seminar. Uh, the, fir the first part, we will look at the relations between critical thinking and ethical thinking, exploring points of contact and potential relations within them. So we'll reflect on how, critical think on how ethical thinking can bring critical thinking alive and how critical thinking, in turn, can improve and perfect ethical thinking. And that will be the first part. The second part will be uh, briefly discussing and focusing on how to develop uh, critical thinking skills and how to apply such skills in our daily life. And I will try to show that critical thinking is crucially important, again, for our society. And because it's essentially, it's ubiquitous. You can find it everywhere. I will provide a number of examples to confirm this. Uh, okay, so, again, uh, here is one of the many definitions of critical thinking. How can you understand critical thinking? Well, as uh, one possible way is to understand it as a purposeful and reflective judgment about what to believe or what to do in response to observation. Uh, what is ethics? Well, it's a very different term to define, but roughly speaking, we can say that ethics refers to matters of right and wrong. So ethics can be uh, defined as the rule of conduct recognized in respect to a particular class of human actions or a particular group. Uh, in other words, whether or not to cheat is an ethical issue, whether or not to dry uh, your hair with a dish towel or let them air dry, uh, it's not an ethical issue. Why ethical consideration has some areas of universal overlap? Uh, ethical practices and solutions to problems are either universal, uh, which is where the connection, the consideration between critical thinking and ethics are drawn, and why it is important to study them. So what what I want to do in this first part of this seminar is essentially, as I say, to show how the application of critical thinking to certain defined situations often enable an individual to make the right decision as to the right ethical choices or principle to apply to certain situation, and how in turn ethical thinking uh, can be critical thinking alive. So I will start by doing, by, I will start, I look at this, I will try to do this by looking at two things. First of all, I will look at what kind of ethical uh, reasoning one can find out there. Uh, these are three examples of ethical reasoning, perhaps the most common, uh, that you can find out there. I will be reviewing these three uh, kind of uh, ethical reasoning, saying a little bit about this, about each of them, and then I will reflect on how, uh, when thinking ethically, what kind of fallacies are most common. So, this will be, this will echo the, uh, remember the first time we look at logical fallacies as mistakes that we should avoid when we think critically. So uh, this, by looking at this, we will try to understand uh, what kind of you know, fallacies in ethical reasoning we should avoid when we want to reason ethically. Um, okay, so types of ethical reasoning, as I said, there are three, these three, starting with the first one. Uh, the first one is value-based ethical, sorry, there are some typos, value-based ethical reasoning, which involves determining whether an action is right or wrong according to whether or not the action in question conforms to certain values, uh, such as truthfulness, responsibility, justice, temperance, courage, the, the list can go on and on. So consider the following example. Uh, imagine this, the mother is, imagine the, word, the mother is uh, telling his, children, his child, uh, you knock over the race, didn't you? And you are trying to blame your, your sister for doing it. That's wrong, you should always take responsibility for your action, and that includes accepting the consequences. So here you can see the speaker is clearly appealing to the level of responsibility. So this is an example of value-based ethical reasoning. Uh, the second, uh, right-based ethical reasoning, that involves determining whether an action is right or wrong according to those in which rights are upheld or violated by the act in question. Such rights might include the right to free speech, the right to own property, the right to vote, the right to be free for, from harm, the right to go wherever you want, and so on. Now, in this case, uh, the general principle, general principle would be something like, depending on the circumstance, of course, one should respect the right of others to express their opinion, uh, their action is wrong because it violates this person's freedom, and so on. Now, there are some problems, these are some examples of, of this kind of reasoning, but there are some problems with this kind of reasoning because, uh, you know, uh, you can say that uh, what happened when different right collides. So if uh, in doing X, uh, if in doing X I oppose my right to A, but if I violates your right to do B, then whose right are more important, mine or yours? Now this is obviously a very complex ethical problem. A lot of philosophers have pondered about this. We're not going to say much about this. Uh, I just wanted to point it out and to point out a brief solution um, to this problem. So one possible approach to answering this question, which is one of the standard, is to revisit the basis for the right in question 
So if one has the right to do A because X and one has the right to do B because of Y, uh, and X is a more important angle than Y, then the right to do A will trump the right to do B. Um, this is normally done even in state properties when you know in, in, when the state wants to appropriate a Dixon property, uh, you know it tells you, uh, look, we need this property for the it's good for the common people for society for some purpose, for, know, building a cemetery, a hospital, whatever. So we get the, the or both the property, <laughs> the property from you, and you cannot do anything to, to, to prevent it. So. But this approach, however, shouldn't work for natural rights, uh, so which are you know only rights in a sense. So when, when this happens, it's it's problematic. Uh, the third kind of uh, animal reasoning is consequence-based ethical reasoning, uh, which involves uh, determining whether an action is right or wrong according to its consequences. So if a certain action will result in a good consequence, then it's the right thing to do. If it results in a bad consequence, it's the wrong thing to do. Again. It's not easy to define other good and bad consequences. Uh, a common definition uh, includes generally the concept of pains and pleasure, but broadly understood uh, to include more than just physical pains or pain, uh, yeah, pains or pleasures. Uh, another possible criteria that you could use are uh, for goodness include the concept of happiness, for being, and benefit. Okay, so these are three types of value reasoning that you can find out there. Three of the most important, significant. Next, uh, what I want to say something about what, what happens uh, when people try to reason ethically. So, what kind of mistakes people do when reason ethically. And next, I want to review three major fallacies uh, that you can find in ethical reasoning. Uh, of course, the list is much longer. We don't need to look at all of them. We just can review these three as an example. So, the first is the ad hominem fallacy. The second is the ease of fallacy. And the third is the arbitrary line fallacy. I will say next a little bit about each. So the dominant, you, you, you know probably this already, is the man uh, in English. Uh, so it means uh, essentially it happens when the order attacks uh, directly someone's character than focusing on the issue at the end, suggesting that because something is wrong with this person, that whatever he says must be wrong, no matter what it is. Uh, the second is uh, the, old, the ease of fallacy, and it happens when um, well, some, we believe that something should be the case, ought to be the case, just because it is the case. Uh, so you might think, why this is a fallacy? Well, obviously, uh, just because something is the case, this does not mean that it should be the case. Uh, just be, because we do something, it doesn't follow that we should do it. Uh, for example, a person might lose his temper and hit someone. Uh, surely, we want to conclude that she is right to do this and she should do it again. Um, so, uh, this, the E old fallacy is also called fact value fallacy. Why? Because you assume that a fact, the way things actually are, imply a value uh, that they should be that way. Uh, third is the arbitrary line fallacy, um, which, well, not limited to ethical, that while not limited to ethical arguments, is perhaps the most common among them. And the error consists in concluding essentially that since the line between two points, L and M, which are close together on some continuum, is arbitrary, then there is no justification for differentiating between two other points, D and W, uh, that are considerably further apart. Uh, so, for example, one might argue, rightly so, that the line between uh, the first trimester and the second trimester and the second trimesters of a pregnancy is arbitrary. There is no real difference between the developing human being at 12 weeks, uh, at 12 weeks plus one day, that's true enough, but uh, it would be rather problematic to conclude that uh, what applies to the old eight, eight point old fetus is also applicable to the two day old fertilized eggs, uh, since there are obviously many differences between these two. Um, so, just because we draw an arbitrary line somewhere, it doesn't really follow that it's not a line worth drawing. In fact, in my separate, so they are significantly distant, so they are significantly important. Okay, this example essentially show uh, how ethical reasoning uh, makes critical thinking come alive, and but also in a sense uh, show how critical thinking can improve and perfect critical thinking. Uh, why? Because critical thinking, if applied correctly, 
it, uh, it can enable uh, precise thinking when analyzing, when analyzing and formulating complex and controversial moral or ethical problems. It can help deepening a person's understanding of one's own moral experience and developing the ability to clearly and precisely express it. It can also, can you think it can also enable, when applied to ethical thinking, um, the possibility to react differently to a given problem and therefore lead to indeterminate views, uh, which, makes that, which means that at least in the first stages we don't jump to conclusions. So we, we're not assuming that ah, this is the right solution, this is the correct answer. So, critical and ethical thinking surely can help clarify the concept of phases involving moral decision making, but they can also, in a sense, contribute to. Uh, each other fight egotism, prejudice, and self-deception uh, through the systematic co cultivation of honesty and integrity. And you yeah, understand these are all important things for everyone nowadays. Okay, so that's the, the essentially the first part. So um, having looked at the relations between critical and ethical thinking very briefly, I want to focus on how to develop critical thinking skills and how to apply such skills in our daily life. This is very general advice, and not very uh, sophisticated because it's Saturday, so we can take it easy. <laughs> and so, uh, the starting point, of course, is, yeah, most of us are what we could be, we are not what we could be, we are less, we could be much more. And so, if you want to develop our critical thinking ability, uh, like in any other skill, uh, because critical thinking does require, as we have seen, some skill, uh, but it's not all, just all about skills, uh, well, we need to practice it and have the right attitude. So, you know, we need to practice essentially and have a conscious commitment to learn. So, in other words, development in thinking requires a gradual process requiring plateaus of learning and just plain hard work. It's not possible to become an excellent thinker sim simply because one wields it. So, attitudes on its own is also not sufficient in practice and skills. And this process, of course, as we saw already the last time takes a long time, it's a life journey project and cannot be picked up in just a few weeks or months, rather it happens over the years. So if that is true, how can we develop as critical, skin, as, as critical thinkers? Mm, so how can we help our students and ourselves to practice better in our everyday life? So next I want to just finish up this talk with a few suggestions and tips based on common sense to help Mature, you mature, me and myself mature as a critical thinker. So really, these are just very brief suggestions. Uh, the first one is uh, to utilize wasted time productively. Uh, so all of us, of course, uh, use uh, some time during the course of our day, waste a lot of time in the course of our day. Uh, why not take advantage of the time uh, that we generally waste by practicing and owning our critical thinking skills? For example, Instead of sitting in front of the TV idly or chatting on Facebook or on VK, which is <laughs> Facebook in Russia, uh, but we could use, uh, we could utilize that time by thinking back over what we did in, during the day and evaluating what went well, what went wrong, and so summarizing uh, what we've been through and thinking how things we could have ended, 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 ended th things differently. Uh, now, when we do this, it's recommended that we record our observation uh, because by doing so we are forced to spell out the details of our daily life and each time we do this we get better at it uh, so uh, we improve our capacity to think through events as they happen. Second suggestion is to very basically to tackle a specific problem a day so when you wake up in the morning you choose a problem you want to focus when you have some time during your day uh, you figure out the problem elements. In other words, you systematically think through this question, some of this question at least. How can I define the problem? What are the ways in which I could solve it? You try to assess the short term and long term implications of the problem and its likely solutions. The important thing is at this stage you are always open. You are prepared to realign your analysis of the problem as new evidence comes, new evidence and information comes available to you. The third thing that you could do is, uh, you remember one of the characteristics, the principal characteristics of critical thinkers that we saw in the first seminar was to uh, their, their, ability, their ability to resist manipulation and their ability to, to reason rationally rather than um, with gut feelings. So uh, you, you need to somehow understand, in certain cases, 
uh, whenever emotion, be it negative or positive, surges in you, uh, you, you need to systematically ask yourself what exactly prompted that emotion. For example, if you're angry, you can ask yourself what is that is making you angry, what are the alternative ways of looking at the situation, do I perceive this situation from a humorous perspective, in other words, try to channel your thinking and match your emotion to your thinking patterns. Uh, another thing you can do is to recognize instances of egocentric thinking in your actions uh, by contemplating answers to the following questions. For instance, uh, do I often become irritable over petty things? Do I do or say things, uh, anything, sorry, do I do or do I say anything irrational just to get my way? Do I impose my will upon others? Do I fail to speak up on my mind when I feel strongly about something and then later feel disempowered? So once you start identifying this egocentric thinking, you can then work to replace it with more rational, systematic self-reflection. Okay, so another suggestion. Uh, you remember the important, crucial thing about critical thinking is to revise, be prone to revise your views, always. So uh, key attribute uh, is the willingness of critical thinking, is the willingness to consider alternate point of views. So you know that by considering them, integrating them, and merging them together, you can develop more defined, well-rounded op op opinions uh, about issues, uh, which must essentially include uh, accepting that your current views might need a bit of reworking. You know, um, for example, imagine the situation: you encounter a senior at your workplace who seems to dislike you. Uh, you might think that you could have done something undesirable or embody a specific, not so likable trait, a personality trait. Instead, rather than focusing on this, recognize that your current view is only one possibility and that the reason the concerned person doesn't seem to like you could be due to some conflicting issues at his or her own end. In fact, if you do so, you might eventually realize that you were incorrect in assessing that the person is like you in the first place, uh, which could then lead to you to reanalyze the interpretation of your current pro processes, the process. Uh, so you see, it's always important that you're flexible enough to be open to revisit and realign your opinions, your thinking as the situation demands. Um, another characteristic of critical thinkers, you remember, was the capacity to, because they are informed, is the capacity to filter facts from fiction. So, um, while listening to another colleague, a friend, your parents, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> another person, uh, show always some hesitance in readily accepting the piece of information that is provided. Instead, ask yourself what you actually know about the subject, what the person who told you this information knows about the subject, uh, where she got that information from, is she an expert on the subject, um, and whether or not she can explain the conclusion, uh, the conclusion which she arrived in a logical manner. Uh, so, even at the risk of being skeptical, ensure that you are always flexible enough to, and this is important, pleasantly explain that you are not necessarily trying to prove anyone wrong, but are just attempting to ascertain whether these are facts or opinions, uh, you know, in which case they might need further investigation. Again, similar to the previous one and other strategies, is to try to avoid quick fixes. So when working with someone, with a friend, with a colleague in a team, if that colleague, that colleague of yours offers a solution that seems hasty or too good to be true, Again, don't readily accept it um, as the best plan of action. Instead, uh, raise your valid concern to the group regarding the feasibility of the solution over the long term. Now, analyze a number of solutions as they come to your mind, uh, to the people you work with, uh, and see if any issue has been overlooked. Uh, you might eventually find out that the quick fix that your colleague proposed was the right approach, but you come through this after some serious thinking. Uh, and importantly is that if you start doing this kind of process, this kind of attitude, developing this kind of attitude, you will soon realize that your desire to investigate has led you away from that strategy of quick fixes that you wanted to avoid in the first, avoid in the first place. So, yes, when you want to deploy critical thinking, it is important that you challenge the status quo, uh, otherwise you will not, never get better at what you're doing. And finally, yeah. Uh, always trust your intellect. Uh, while you do need to closely monitor your ego or any rigid, rigid opinion you may possess for a lack of openness, you also need to trust that you are capable of analyzing a situation and reaching your own informed conclusions. 
In other words, trust yourself and your ability to assess situation, uh, analyze data, and draw intelligent and informed conclusion. So, ensure that at least this technique, if not so, all of them, still some of them, are followed. Uh, but especially, be sure that uh, those that involve others uh, are pursued as amicably as you can, as friendly as you can, in a polite yet persuasive manner, because otherwise, obviously, they might backfire on you. <laughs> you, know, uh, you have to remember that when using these techniques, it is, it is important uh, to emphasize uh, that, you know, to yourself and to others that you are engaged in something like a personal experiment. Uh, you are testing ideas in your everyday life, you are simulating and mirroring of them in the light of the actual experience. You don't want just to find flaws in people, be unpolite or negative, uh, because that's not nice. So, uh, conclusion is owning your critical skills, much, much like any other skill, uh, calls for serious practice and the right attitude. Uh, your practice will surely be in progress, and with progress, insightful thinking will slowly but surely become second nature to you. So, finally, to conclude this and to show you uh, why critical thinking is important and therefore is ubiquitous and therefore uh, why you should study it, uh, I would like to review briefly these 10 examples that are taken from this book, published in 2016. Yes? Um, and so, basically, you will see. Uh, probably, hopefully, why studying critical thinking is something that is not just related to academia, but it's important also in your, in your daily life. Uh, so, you can say that a person, according to those who wrote this book, they are Fashione and Gittens or Gittens? How do you pronounce it? Gittens. Gittens? Gittens. Or Gittens? Gittens? Okay, so according to that guy. Um, so, uh, critical thinking happens when a person is trying to interpret any angry friend's needs and give the friend some help and support. But it also happens when a manager is trying to be as objective as possible when settling a dispute by summarizing the alternatives with fairness to all sides to disagreement. Uh, but it also happens, critical thinking, when a team of scientists is working, for instance, uh, with great precision through a complex experiment in an effort to gather and analyze data as well as when a creative writer is organizing ideas for the plot of a story and attending to the complex motivation and personalities of the fictional characters. But critical thinking also happens uh, in very simple situations when a, small, you know, a, pers a person running a small business is trying to anticipate the possible economic and human consequences of various ways to increase sales or reduce costs, when a general or a colonel or any other military ranking is working out, the tactical plans for a dangerous military mission, when a soccer coach is uh, during half time working on new tactics for attacking, for attacking the weaknesses of the other team. Um, critical thinking also happens when a student more simply explain to his or her peers the methodology used to reach a particular conclusion or why now a certain methodology or standard of proof was applied. Uh, it also happens when an educator, teacher, is using clever questioning to guide the students to, new, to understand, to get new insights. Or even more simply when police, uh, crime scene analysts, lawyers, judges, juries, systematically investigate, interrogate, examine and evaluate the evidence in a trial as they seek justice. So, this, you see, this, all these examples are supposed to show you that we all encounter opportunities in our daily life to engage problems and decisions using strong critical thinking, and that everyone really uh, needs to think ahead and plan and solve problems. Uh, therefore, in a sense, everyone needs critical thinking. And what? Well, yeah, that's why you, as a student, you should study it. And that's it. <laughs>